There we go. Welcome everybody. This workshop is called the Inner Workings of Pranayama. So my intention is to give a, an overview in theory of what's sort of happening under the hood when we practice pranayama or subconsciously throughout the day and night, what happens internally as a result of breathing patterns uh, that we may not be aware of. Breathing is the front door to the nervous system. There aren't many other practices uh, that have such an acute effect on our energy levels, on our cognition, on our heart rate, and other aspects of physiology that contribute to sensing states of calm, dis-ease, frenetic energy. And the beautiful thing about practicing your breathing, just like going to the gym and working on a muscle group, you can train it to become stronger. Uh, and whereas you go to the gym to make a muscle stronger, you train your breath to make it more functional. And I really love the way the Oxygen Advantage presents healthy breathing as functional breathing, because amid all of the, the noise on the internet and social media about breath work, because it's really, it's really booming, it's really becoming more and more popular. I like the term functional breathing because at the end of the day, breath training should be about making the body work better just like the kind of yoga we teach on the, this platform. It's not about doing yoga to become good at yoga or to be able to do the splits or to be able to stand on your head. Like that really doesn't matter. Same thing with breathing. You're not practicing breathing just to become able to do these uh, energy shifting pranayamas. You're really practicing breathing to become more physiologically functional, have the organs function better. And the necessary ingredient to all of this better functioning is oxygen, right? And so there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of myths about how we oxygenate the body and how we should be breathing. And today I hope to dispel some of those myths, especially you all are interested in yoga and, and wow, whereas in more ancient forms of pranayama, you would sit and have a formal pranayama practice, functional breathing is something you can practice when you do anything, when you're doing yoga asana, when you're sitting on the train, commuting, when you're driving, when you're walking, when you're sitting to eat. So Functional breathing isn't just a formal practice that you would do and set it aside half an hour for. And it certainly can be, and you can practice your breathing in very structured ways. But the beauty of this method is that you can practice it at any time and the benefits are resounding. Before I get into talking about what functional breathing is, I find it helpful to talk about the opposite, what dysfunctional breathing is. And so I'll invite you guys to unmute yourself. And when I say the word dysfunctional breathing, what comes to mind? Like, what does that picture in your head look like? I think when you breathe too flat, when it's just when you use your upper part of the lung and you can't uh, breathe deeper and use the full capacity of your lung. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so upper chest, not full mm -hmm. recruitment of the, the organs that support breathing or the muscles, yep. yeah. Anything else that comes to mind for dysfunctional breathing? Or hyperventilation, when you breathe too fast and also too flat and 
so you're just using yeah again a little part of your lung or the balloons are just a bit um with air fill filled with air then yeah if you could use it in a um less fast and fuller way mm -hmm. great yeah you that's what i've been to say too like attic breath out of breath breathlessness yeah yeah great. yeah like that attic erratic breathing yep not in a consistent pattern totally yeah so those are yes that's all correct and so i'm going to start sharing a a presentation and we'll get into more specifically a little bit about dysfunctional breathing. So can you all see this? Yeah. Okay, great. So this is the workshop that you're taking. <laughs> Okay, so dysfunctional breathing. Really, there are lots of presentations of what it can look like, but in essence, all forms of dysfunctional breathing have one thing in common, and it's a disturbance to the breathing pattern. So the breath is just like the wave coming onto shore, like there's a tidal pattern that happens naturally. And whether it's hyperventilation, over breathing, shortness of breath, you know, all these, there's lots of medical terms we can get into as well. Really, it's when a stimulus, either internal or external, is causing a disruption to that pattern. And that can happen for a variety of reasons. So some things that are dysfunctional breathing, mouth breathing. When you're breathing through your mouth, there's not going to be a natural ebb and flow because the mouth has zero anatomical functions related to breathing. You should never breathe through your mouth. The mouth is for eating and drinking and speaking. Um, even during physical exercise, humans were not designed to be breathing through their mouth. Now, it gets a little different when you're an Olympian or a professional athlete and your performance is not about breathing, but how well you can kick a soccer ball into a net or how high you can go on a ski jump, right? So I'm not necessarily talking about this group of people who, who are performing a sport, but for recreational athletes, for every other kind of human being, the mouth is not used for breathing. The nose has over 30 functions related to breathing. The mouth has zero, zero. And in fact, mouth breathing can contribute to deformation of the jaw and facial structure, narrowing of the teeth and the jaws, narrowing of the airways, um, which can become a sort of a accumulating problem, mouth breathing, narrowing of airways. Then you feel like you don't have as much uh, uh, capacity for breath. So you mouth breathe on top of that. And so it's a, it's a downhill slope. It's also just, really unattractive <laughs> and it used to be kind of an insult to say oh you what a mouth breather you know not probably pc anymore <laughs> okay upper chest breathing yeah just as sonia was talking about the a lot of times when people are anxious or scared or upregulated due to physical exercise the breath will stay in the upper lobes of the lung uh this is not a full breath. It causes the breath pattern to be shorter and quicker. And in a little bit, I'll explain why that is detrimental. Noisy breathing. The breath really shouldn't be that loud at rest. Um, ideally, eventually, as you train the breath, it shouldn't be that loud during exercise either. <laughs> uh, but at rest, the breath, if you are anatomically sound and in homeostasis, it should be quiet. You shouldn't be able to hear somebody's breathing next to you. Frequent sighing and yawning. These are uh, responses, the, these are responses of the nervous system to a, a, an existing pattern of dysfunctional breathing. So breathing too 
shallow or too deeply or too quickly, the body will try to compensate and balance the blood gases of carbon dioxide and oxygen and others. And that will come out in a yawn, like when we're tired and maybe we're breathing shallow and we feel like the blood gases aren't balanced, the body will yawn or frequent sighing is a desire to get out more CO2 because we feel that we've accumulated too much. So of course, you know, there are going to be some natural sighing and yawning happening during the day. And I know that the physiological sigh is a very big thing in the breath work world right now. And we can talk about that later, but really when you have functional breathing, this should not be something that's frequent. Paradoxical breathing. So this is more to do with the biomechanics. It's when you take a breath in and you contract in and you take a breath out and you expand out. So training that is not so much uh, training the, the biochemistry, but the biomechanics of breathing. So really when we breathe in, it should be an expansive 360 inhalation. And when we exhale, it should contract back to, to center. And things like sleep apnea. So this is when you cease breathing for more than 10 seconds at a time during sleep. Um, obviously a little scary, especially if you sleep alone, you could cease breathing altogether. Um, a lot of people to treat sleep apnea will, if it's severe enough, will be hooked up to breathing machines, CPAP machines um, that supply oxygen to them. But there are some other ways to help your breathing during sleep that don't involve medical uh, devices. So we'll get into that as well. Wonderful. So hyperventilation is usually the thing I hear most when people, uh, when I ask people what dysfunctional breathing is or looks like, they say, oh, hyperventilation hyperventilation. And I think most of us will conceptualize or imagine hyperventilation to look something like this, like very fast and very shallow breathing often associated with anxiety or panic attacks. However, hyperventilation is not just anxiety or panicked breathing. Hyperventilation is a simple equation. Minute volume times respiratory rate um, is gonna give you, excess of both of these is gonna give you hyperventilation. So when you're breathing a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of volume, so big breaths in and out, this is hyperventilation. When you're breathing really, really quickly, even if it's tiny and shallow, this can also be hyperventilation because all hyperventilation means is breathing in excess of your metabolic requirements. So the volume you're breathing times the respiratory rate when they're both bumped up, this is a hyperventilation. So you could be um, in a yoga class and your teacher tells you to take some big breaths into the nose and sigh it out through the mouth. If you do that several times, it's hyperventilating. If you do that once, that's hyperventilating. The body doesn't need to breathe that much. Uh, so it's not just this anxiety, panic breathing. It can also be just bigger forms of relaxed breathing that is it's too much volume or too much speed. Kapalabhati, we lead it all the time. This is a hyperventilation. It's a tiny little exhale, but the body does not need to be breathing that much at rest. We do that for the physiological effects of upregulation and shining the skull and clearing out mucus. So it has benefits, but Hyperventilation isn't a dirty word or having a negative connotation. It's just really a style of breathing that can often be associated with dysfunctions. So the example I like to use is if you had like a bowl of food, so this is like my breakfast, my morning oatmeal, minus the raw fruit. <laughs> um, you can have the same amount of oatmeal. If I eat it with a big spoon or a small spoon, though it's going to affect uh, how quickly and how much I'm putting on the spoon. So if I use a big spoon and I'm eating this oatmeal, which is the same amount, I'm taking big scoops, but eating that slower probably. But if I'm taking little spoonfuls and I'm eating it more quickly because I can eat the little spoonfuls more quickly, well, I, I could still be eating too much food. It's just a matter of how much how quickly I'm doing it and how much I'm taking at once. So just like caloric intake, how much versus how frequent, breathing is the same. 
how much are you breathing? How much volume are you breathing? How many liters of air? And how frequently is the respiration happening? Does anybody have any questions at this point before I get into the opposite, which is functional breathing? Yeah, Tiger, can I ask you a quick question about the hyperventilating? I heard that when you hyperventilate that you can have a back and breathe into that back. So it will deceive a bit. So could you then say when someone is hyperventilating, the body is over oxygenated? Is that correct? Or is it then not the case? Is it the opposite? So yes, but let me explain around that a little bit. Um, so before the invention of pharmaceuticals for anxiety, or rather before the, pro the great proliferation of anxiety and, and panic drugs, um, often psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists would, if somebody was having a panic attack or an anxiety episode, which presents with hyperventilation, they would give them that paper bag to breathe into uh, because as they breathe out that CO2, and they rebreathe it in, it has a tranquilizing effect. And I'll explain why that's happening. So um, oxygen has an upregulating effect and carbon dioxide has a downregulating effect on the body within certain levels and depending on the breather. Um, but in general, that's true. And we kind of have a of a threshold of how much we can be oxygenated. Like, it's not like you can just keep going oxygen, oxygen, oxygen forever. Like the way we measure how oxygenated the body is, is how, um, how much oxygen is in the blood. So the more, the faster and quicker and more hyperventilatory you are, the more oxygen just stays in the blood. So it looks like we're very oxygenated. Um, and I will, ex I will explain this in a little bit um, when I get to the, the chemical parts. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, and Kari had a follow-up too. When you're breathing that quickly, the oxygen isn't actually getting to the part of the lungs where gas can be exchanged. So you're just breathing out the oxygen as well. So it, you're not having functional gas exchange is that, but, and I'm gonna get into this in a minute, but when you breathe out all that CO2 and you breathe in a higher concentration of carbon dioxide, that is going to allow the oxygen to get into the body more efficiently. And I will explain that. So functional breathing is pretty much the opposite of all the presentations of dysfunctional breathing. Um, but it can be boiled down to three things. First of all, Functional breathing happens through the nose. So you, can, you cannot be functionally breathing through the mouth. The mouth is not designed to breathe. It's designed to eat, kiss, sleep, drink, talk. Um, functional breathing is slow. So the opposite of the, the upregulated hyperventilation that looks like a fast breath Slow breathing allows the full descent of the diaphragm. It allows gas exchange to occur because you're getting into the lowest lobes of the lungs. And to that point, it's low. So these, this is kind of a, just a snapshot of functional breathing, but if you can remember nose, slow and low, that is the kind of breathing I think everybody should be practicing before they ever try to attempt these big hyperventilatory pranayamas or breath work techniques. Because if you don't have functional breathing, if you can't breathe like this at rest or even into slightly upregulated states during low intensity exercise, the big breathing is going to be really overwhelming. And I'll get into that shortly. So functional breathing, nose slow and low. So as I, I'm going to say this a million times, the mouth is not for breathing. Like I encourage anybody who has another form of exercise practice, whether it's running, cycling, walking, whatever you do, try to breathe through your nose as much as possible. The nose is a beautiful part of our body. <laughs> um, it's designed to do many things quite well that the mouth simply cannot in terms of respiration. The nose filters air. So when you breathe through the mouth, it's like drinking pond water versus 
filtered water. You're, you're not having any mechanism that's filtering out bacteria, pathogens, pollution. So this is especially important if you live somewhere with higher levels of, of uh, pollution or, or air, air quality is lower. Um, the nose is gonna filter this out. It's like your personal little Brita filter. Nasal breathing is related to the parasympathetic nervous system. So mouth breathing is fight or flight, it's upregulating. Nasal breathing is parasympathetic. It's related to the rest and digest side of the nervous system automatically. So nasal breathing will always be a more calm version of breathing. It slows the air coming into the body because the Nasal passages are so much more narrow than this big hole of your mouth. You can take in so much air so quickly through the mouth, but the nose provides resistance and brings the breath in slower, which is important. It oxygenates you automatically more because the breath is slower, because the breath is lighter. It has that resistance through the nose the gas exchange is going to be able to occur more efficiently. So mouth breathing is not a very efficient way to oxygenate the body, even though you may be breathing physically more volumes of air. Nasal breathing dilates your airways and blood vessels in the, in the nasal cavity and, and lungs. So this is important because it promotes better blood flow. It dilates the smooth muscle so the body can feel relaxed. And when the airways are dilated, the body can feel more in that rest and digest uh, side of the nervous system so that the breathing has that rhythmic calm quality. And also when the, the blood vessels in the lungs dilate, that oxygen that you're, be that you're breathing in is going to be more evenly distributed through the lungs to actually get to the, the lowest part of the lungs. Nasal breathing is hydrating. So you retain like 40% more water breathing in through the nose compared to mouth breathing. So if you're somebody who likes to run and you are not hydrating enough in general, but then you're after a run, maybe it's slightly colder out. You're like, man, I feel so dry. I feel so, so aired out. Then the mouth is doing nothing for hydration. So if it's a really hot day, you should not be mouth breathing and doing exercise. You shouldn't be mouth breathing doing exercise in general, but especially if it's a time when you're sweating a lot, a lot, a lot. Nasal breathing automatically deepens the breath because it slows it down and it will allow the body to be more relaxed to let the diaphragm descend. So it promotes functional breathing all the way from the nose to the muscle of the diaphragm. Nasal breathing, as I mentioned before, in opposition with the mouth breathing, it's going to promote a better facial and jaw structure so that the airways stay um, more open. Uh, it, nasal breathing promotes a widening of the, of the jaw. So really your tongue should fit on the roof of your mouth. The tip of the tongue should just rest at the back of the teeth. People who have very narrow jaws from years of mouth breathing won't be able to feel that. Uh, so it this is a whole nother workshop in itself, like myofunctional therapy and all of the ways that um, like mewing techniques can widen the airways, but know that nasal breathing alone will support a, more, a healthier facial structure. Okay, so there are three um, pillars of functional breathing, biochemistry, biomechanics, and psychophysiology. The biochemistry really comes down to one kind of breathing, and that is breathing lighter, which means you are taking in far less air and you are breathing out far less air. So this does not mean you're not fully descending the diaphragm nor taking a full breath, but when the breath is noisy and when the breath is heavy and fast and harsh, you're not oxygenating yourself very efficiently at all. So breathing light is rule number one for functional breathing. We wanna be breathing weightlessly. 
it wants to be sattvic. It wants to feel um, effortless. So this is a molecule, it's carbon dioxide, <laughs> one carbon, two oxygens. <laughs> and it is the primary stimulus for us to breathe. So we don't breathe, the body doesn't, the brain doesn't tell the body to breathe because we need more oxygen. The brain tells the body to breathe because there's too much carbon dioxide. The key though, however, is that we need higher levels of carbon dioxide in order to oxygenate ourselves. So it's really counterintuitive. Breath patterns and functional breathing does not really revolve around oxygen, even though it's this most important molecule we want into our body. It's really how prana enters the body being more oxygenated, but it all hinges around the balance of carbon dioxide. So it's not a waste product. We grow up learning that we breathe in oxygen, we exhale carbon dioxide, the trees breathe carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen. And it's this beautiful symbiosis. And that is true. Um, it is a beautiful symbiosis, but to think that carbon dioxide is the exhaled waste product or the metabolic waste product of cellular respiration makes it seem like it's something that the body just wants to get rid of when really most of us are not good at retaining enough of it, which is why we are so stimulated by it. So if we, we don't have a high tolerance for this molecule for carbon dioxide, our body's gonna be so sensitive to it and wanna breathe it out faster and harder and deeper. So breathing light hinges on having a certain amount of tolerance for the gas carbon dioxide and really all good breath training for functional breathing raises that tolerance, which will just make your arousal threshold higher, which means that you're not so stimulated to breathe in fast because you can handle the, the higher levels of CO2. Um, CO2 also dilates the airways. This is why um, nasal breathing, um, I said it dilates, it's because nasal breathing, because it's slower and it's lighter, will produce will accumulate more CO2 in the blood and that will dilate the blood vessels and nasal cavities um, to have more open airways. Um, if you're ever, we can practice this later, if you're ever feeling really congested and not open in the airways, well, holding your breath or breathing lighter to, op to retain more CO2 will actually dilate and open and clear some of that mucus. Um, and it's, it, it, it's, it's really cool um, how breath holding can help with dilating the airways. Perhaps the most important function of carbon dioxide though is not for simply dilating the airways. And this is really the, the kernel of wisdom that everything else I'm gonna tell you hinges on. Carbon dioxide is necessary to release oxygen into the tissues. So when we breathe in, fast and shallow and harsh, and we're technically hyperventilating, breathing more than the body requires, we are breathing out so much CO2 and we're not retaining very much in the blood. However, we need carbon dioxide to release oxygen from the blood and into the body. Oxygen is, 98% of the oxygen in all of your blood vessels, your arterial oxygen, is bound to a protein called hemoglobin. And it is only with the heightened or greater presence of carbon dioxide that that oxygen will dissociate from its hemoglobin bind and be sent to the organs and tissues and cells in the body outside of the blood. So we need carbon dioxide to oxygenate our bodies. If we're breathing out CO2 constantly because we're breathing too fast or too harsh and we're not getting that gas exchange, our oxygen is just staying bound in the blood, which is not that helpful when we're running and our calves are starting to burn because we need oxygen um, in parts of our bodies that are so energy demandant um, to make ATP, to make energy. So this all um, 
is based on a scientific uh, discovery called the Bohr effect. I believe it was discovered in about 1906 or so, um, over a hundred years ago. We've, we've known about this for a long time. So the Bohr effect works like this. Greater levels of carbon dioxide lead to a slight decrease in pH. So it makes the blood just slightly, slightly more acidic, um, which causes the oxygen to dissociate from the hemoglobin. So this would be something to write down and to take note of. It's something that a lot of breath instruction is ignorant to when we are guided to take big, deep breaths all the time. Really, I think what people and a lot of yoga teachers want to achieve by taking a big breath in and sighing it out is really to relax the muscles. And you can do that through other forms of progressive muscle relaxation. But really, if we want to oxygenate the body and calm the body with more CO2, because it has a tranquilizing effect, we need to be more tolerant to CO2 so it can have, so we can have greater amounts of it in the blood to then trigger this greater release of oxygen. So in essence, to breathe light, we're going to practice feeling breathless, which is counterintuitive. You think, oh, I'm gonna practice my breathing to, to feel you know oxygenated. Like really we should be practicing feeling breathless because that's what will train our breath to become more functional, to train our tolerance to CO2. It's just like going to the gym. Like I need to train using my muscles and feeling how challenging it is to lift the dumbbells in order to then out in the world, be able to lift something heavy if I need to. We need to train having breathlessness and having that slight stress on the breathing in order to adapt to stressful situations in the world. So this is why I also really prefer to call it breath training instead of breath work. I don't think breathing should ever be laborious. I don't think it should ever be some big undertaking. I think we should be training the breath to adapt to our life, not just working the breath to do another thing. So let's practice breathing light and I will stop sharing my screen for a moment. Um, any questions before we embody it and feel what I'm talking about. Good. Okay. So sit well. You cannot breathe well if you are not sitting or standing well or laying down well. <laughs> I want you to start taking regular breaths in and out through the nose. Maybe notice how quiet or not your breath is. Maybe you can even sense which nostril is more open. Springtime, I know a lot of allergies happen, so maybe you're feeling a little congested. Now the next breath in and out you take, I want it to, you to start lightening it up. So each breath you take, excuse me, make it lighter than the one before. Think less about the diaphragmatic recruitment and more about the area of the rim of the nostrils. So that eventually your breath becomes so light that it feels like you're just breathing in an inch and breathing out an inch. Teeth are separated, lips are together. So the breathing becomes minimized, a very minimal, tiny breath. Again, don't worry about the diaphragm or the, the the breathing biomechanics right now, just think that you're making your breath very, very little. Eventually, as you continue to make the breath very small, you're going to start feeling a sense of air hunger, a little bit of breathlessness. And if you don't start to feel that, you can cup your hands around your nose and your mouth. And this will give a similar, um, sensation to the paper bag effect, right? You're pooling that CO2 in your hands and you're breathing it back in. And you wanna reach this point that is 
comfortable yet uncomfortable. This Goldilocks principle. You definitely feel like you could be breathing more and you feel a little bit out of breath, comfortable enough to keep it going for another minute. Sometimes it will take a few rounds maybe to get used to or to find that, that me happy medium. But if you don't feel any air hunger, if you don't feel any little stress, breathe lighter or cover your nose and your mouth. It should feel challenging. It should not feel like it's an easy breath. As you find that tolerable amount of air hunger, you might start to notice uh, more saliva gathering in the mouth. That would be a sign that the parasympathetic nervous system is becoming more dominant because our digestion, rest and digest, begins in the mouth. The saliva has enzymes that break down food. So that's a good sign. Keep it going. Minimizing the breathing. It's so tiny and probably tinier than you think. So if you're doing an inch, try a centimeter. Tiny, tiny, tiny. The breath becomes imperceptible to the outside eye. Only you know that this little tiny bit of air is being exchanged in and out through the nose. Keep it going. Relax the face, relax into it. 20 more seconds. Should not feel very easy. And let that go. Find a regular breath into the nose. Try to keep it light but not as tiny. And take a moment to notice the qualities of the mind and body right now. So you are working with a lot of carbon dioxide. Chances are you might feel even a little sleepy after that. <laughs> um, when I'm doing this to people in person, I can really see their eyeballs. If their eyes are glassed over and glazed, I know they were doing it right because they have those like bedroom sleepy eyes. So that is a real example of how carbon dioxide, not oxygen, CO2, this waste product, as we think of it, is really the necessary component for downregulation practices. It's not about breathing more oxygen. It's really about breathing much less volume of air so that the CO2 rises in the blood as a result of the cellular, cellular respiration that's happening but it's not being breathed out. Any questions about that or any observations as you were doing that? Did it feel challenging or any, anything to report? Nelson said it felt good. Definitely, it did, it did feel good, but I have a question and maybe I'm thinking about this too much, but does it almost put you into like a hyperventilation state or is that me like just really trying to focus that I'm kind of, because I'm trying to breathe so light, I was almost like a inch in and inch out, inch in, inch out, instead of like taking that pause at the top and that pause at the bottom, like I would if I was just regularly breathing, was mm -hmm. I doing it incorrectly? You weren't doing it incorrectly. This is simply you being confronted with your tolerance for carbon dioxide. So because um, most people aren't working on upping their tolerance to CO2, when, when they do a, a breath like this that is radically raising the levels of CO2 in the blood and dispersing more oxygen uh, to the tissues, it's gonna feel like you need to breathe quicker because it's gonna feel like you need to breathe more. So it, it's not actually okay. a, a hyperventilation because you're not breathing enough if you feel that way. Um, in this breath, okay. in this breath, because if you're breathing that tiny, you're breathing less than you, than you need to. So it should, it should feel a little, little bit stressful. Um, yeah. So you're probably doing it right. Uh, I, I recommend people doing this three times a day, three minutes a day. 
and it can really help the, the CO2 tolerance. Mm -hmm. If I were to have a pulse oximeter on my finger, which measures two things, it measures my heart rate and it measures the percentage of oxygen that is occupied in the blood. So normal at normal levels, it's 95 to 99% because it's the, the little snapshot that this is taking of my blood, it sees that, oh, well, 95 to 99% of this surface area in the blood is oxygenated. There's, there's that many oxygen molecules. When we're doing this kind of breathing and other techniques we'll, we'll get into, uh, that number is going to drop. Your percentage of arterial oxygen might go down to 94, 92, or 91, which means that there's no longer that oxygen in the blood because the CO2 rose and now that oxygen has gone to the tissues. It's gone throughout the body. So that's what's, that's what's happening there. So yeah, it, it should feel a little confrontational because most of us are not that comfortable with those higher levels of CO2. Yeah. Any other questions or, or observations? All good? Okay. Fabulous. It, it, and it will take some time to get used to something like that because we're normally taking these whole breaths in and out, but really the body doesn't need to be breathing that much, especially as we keep training the breath. Okay, back to the presentation. So that was good. So I, that's the first um, pillar of functional breathing, breathe light. And when the, and so the, what I mean by this is you want to be breathing lighter in during the day and during the night, but that exercise breathe light was a, 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 a very pronounced version of breathing light. So you're not, you're not supposed to be breathing one inch one out all the time. In general, you want your breathing to be lighter, but doing your breathing that tiny will train the breathing to be lighter and, and effortless at rest. So that, that's the exercise you do to attain functional light breathing. The next pillar of that the oxygen advantage um, emphasizes for functional breathing is the breathing biomechanics. So we worked on the the breathing biochemistry, the balance of CO2 and oxygen in the blood. Um, this aspect is one that I think uh, people who do yoga really like a lot because we're often in class told to take a diaphragmatic breath or a belly breath, right? We hear that, hear that all the time. Take a big breath into the belly. How many times have you heard that? Um, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. I just don't think it's very accurate. So breathing deep is not a feeling. It's, it's a spatial term. Depth is a spatial uh, word. So when we talk about breathing deep, we're not talking about where, like this location. We're talking about space-wise getting depth. So that means breathing into the lowest lobes of the lungs. And something I really wanna to emphasize today is belly breathing is not the same thing as deep breathing. They're not the same. Belly breathing is referring to directing the breath to a place in the body, whereas deep breathing, if it's functional, is talking about where in the lungs spatially we're going. Okay, so that's a big takeaway. Belly breathing is not the same thing as deep breathing. First of all, the belly doesn't breathe, right? <laughs> the lungs, diaphragm, nasal passages do. Um, <laughs> and while it can be soothing to direct the breath there and a nice mental tool to get that engagement of the diaphragm, it's not the same thing. And really in, in one of the most simple and beautiful forms of pranayama, the dirga breath, the complete breath, it's the three-part breath that you, it goes belly, ribs, chest, right? And really when we take that first part into the belly, the breath doesn't stay there when we move into the ribs side to side. The, the belly should deflate back as you move into the ribs and up into the, to the chest and the collarbones. So it's a convenient term to get people to move their breath down with their upper chest breathers, but it's not really where we should be breathing at all. 
you can take your first and second fingers and just gently stopper your nostrils so you can't get any breath in. And you could move your belly in and out, right? Like you can manipulate your belly without breathing. Release that. The way I'm going to show you how to breathe deeper, you can't manipulate. It has to come from the breathing muscles, which you can't just direct with your brain. A little bit about the depth of breathing. So does anybody know what this is? Are these the alveolas, where the yes. um, exchange of oxygen and um, yes. carbon dioxide <laughs> happens? <laughs> or not? Exactly. I don't know. So these, this is a very small sample um, of a part of your uh, lung anatomy called the alveoli, or alveoli, depending on how you pronounce it. They look like these little bunches of grapes. They're they're amazing. This is where gas exchange occurs uh, in the lungs. So the way our lung anatomy works is when you get down past the throat and into the trachea, like the main tree trunk of the lungs, it breaks off into two other tree trunks called the bronchi and then into other little branches called the bronchioles. And at the end of the bronchioles, at the, at the lowest parts of the lungs are the alveoli. And this is where carbon dioxide and oxygen are actually exchanged. So depth of breathing, if we're just talking about breathing into the belly, it disregards the most important part of the lung, which is alveoli, the alveoli where the, where the gas exchange is occurring. So to breathe deep, we need to get the breath spatially deeper into the lungs, which means we need a full descent of the diaphragm how do we get a full descent of the diaphragm? Well, usually it's not just belly breathing because we can feel like we're pushing out our belly to breathe and getting deeper when really, as we just demonstrated, we can do that without breathing. So I have this, this bi-directional arrow here. I want us to start thinking about deep breathing as lateral breathing for now. Eventually, it's my opinion that the breath should be 360 degrees and spherical and you should feel it everywhere. But for the purposes of today, I want us to, when we hear the word, take a deep breath, I want us to think, let's take a lateral breath. When you breathe in through the nose and you are getting the breath into the lowest lobes of the lungs because the diaphragm expands, naturally the ribs are gonna move side to side. This is important for a few reasons. This side to side expansion not only makes space for the full descent of the diaphragm, but it also creates something called intra abdominal pressure, which is stabilization for the spine. So, without this lateral expansion, without this true depth of breathing, the spine is not protected in the same way. There is a phenomenally huge correlation between upper chest breathing, so shallow breathing, and low back pain. People who know how to breathe deep and get that lateral expansion experience far less back pain because the spine has support from the intra-abdominal pressure. So it's super important to code in our brains. It's not just belly breathing. That doesn't really do anything for the support of the structure. It's, we need the lateral breathing for the proper mechanics and to not compensate into different uh, supporting muscles. So but it's also important to be sitting well when we're breathing because if we're hunched over, the diaphragm is going to remain in this pre-contracted position and it won't be able to fully expand downward. And when that happens, the spine is not protected. It's not a deep breath. It's more shallow, it's quicker. So sitting well and getting that side to side expansion is what I want you to think about when you hear the words, take a deep breath, take a lateral breath, take a wide breath. And um, yeah, so lateral breathing is truly deeper breathing. Let's practice it. Let's practice that. 
So take your hands and frame the lowest ribs. Feel free your ribs and then just frame your hands on the outside of your body around that. Let the shoulders be relaxed, sit well. So we're not flaring out the ribs here because just as this prevents the descent of the diaphragm, so does this, so does a hyperextension of the spine. So we wanna be really in the middle of ourselves. You're welcome to close the eyes if that feels comfortable, otherwise just a soft gaze. As you start to take breaths in, I want you to get this sense that your ribs are moving out into the inner edges of your hands. And as you exhale, your hands move closer together as the diaphragm re returns upward to its resting state. So breath in is the contraction, the expansion down of the diaphragm, that intra-abdominal pressure being created. And the exhalation is the return back to center. So whereas a lot of people instruct putting a hand on the belly to feel the breath, I like this so much more because you, you know that you're getting the lateral, truly deeper breathing. And also, this is not something you can just do with your mind. As I showed you, you could plug the nostrils and move the belly in and out. You cannot cease breathing and in your mind, move your ribs side to side. Only a truly deep breath can do that. A relaxed breath can do that. I also like the tactile feedback of the hands on the lowest parts of the ribs on the outside of the rib cage, because it, it gives you a way to make contact with yourself, which is very soothing. Um, there are instruments called buteco belts. They're kind of like a big fat back brace that goes around the level of the diaphragm that will give this tactile feedback to you without the hands. It's a wonderful investment to train diaphragmatic breathing. I think they're maybe only 40 or $50. I use mine all the time when I'm traveling. So as you feel for this lateral expansion, you can visualize the diaphragm truly descending. You can visualize your spine being supported and, and hugged and stabilized. And then if you wanna make it a little bit more challenging, if this feels quite easy, you can start to lighten up the breath making it smaller, but still trying to get that diaphragmatic expansion downward and the lateral expansion side to side. Because eventually we want deep breathing that is also light. And that's the, the harder thing to train is layering those two. And then you can release that. So those are the, the first two pillars. Does anybody have any questions about um, deep breathing or anything biomechanics wise? All good. There is immense amounts of information I could be covering um, for the purposes of this workshop though. Just even that code switch in your brain from a belly breath to a lateral breath is gonna do so much more for your breathing biomechanics. So I highly encourage that little mental switch as you practice your functional breathing. Okay. And the last uh, of the third pillars of functional breathing is the psychophysiology. So this is how the body and mind, which aren't really that different, but how these the body and the mind play on each other to support homeostasis. So when you have an upregulated mind, because the body's upregulated, when you have an upregulated body, the mind is also going to be more energized and buzzing and maybe even over the edge into states of panic or anxiety. So the breathing uh, function or technique that is most supportive of sound body, sound mind with really the tapping into that parasympathetic nervous system, de-stressing, uh, preventing burnout in our, in our very hyper-stimulated hustle culture is slow breathing. And 
this in tandem with the lateral breathing, I think truly gives a quote unquote deep breath. And the beautiful thing about breathing slow is that just by breathing through the nose, you're gonna breathe slower. And by breathing slow, you have a direct on button to your parasympathetic nervous system. So when you breathe slower, you stimulate the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is our 10th cranial nerve and it innervates just about every major organ and also has a passageway through the diaphragm. And the, the vagus nerve is such a beautiful part of our body because it, a lot of times we think of cranial nerves as, as top down. Really most of the signaling from the vagus nerve is bottom up. So it's really our organs communicating up to our brain. And this is why slow breathing has such a potent and quick effect on our nervous system. Because when we breathe slow and that vagus nerve is stimulated, we get all these signals from the body to the brain that we are calm, we are safe. Another very cool physiological component of this is when the vagus nerve is stimulated, our, uh, we have a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine and that is pumped into the heart when we stimulate the vagus nerve, which pretty immediately slows down the heart rate. So slow breathing stimulates the vagus nerve and in kind slows the heart rate. So we get this signaling that the body is calmer because the heart rate is slowing, it is safe, it is, can rest and digest. And this is why I like to think of slow breathing as just an on button or stimulating the vagus nerve as an on button for the parasympathetic nervous system because it's actually quite simple. It relates to that equation of hyperventilation. So hyperventilation can be volume, it's how much you're breathing, but it's also cadence. How quickly are you breathing really feeds the upregulation that hyperventilation usually accompanies. So slow breathing is a technique that is so simple to teach to other people and to give to yourself. That is the bread and butter of breath training, in my opinion, because also when you're slowing down the breath, pretty automatically you're gonna get a greater descent of the diaphragm and get that lateral expansion. Slower breathing also retains more CO2. So you also get those biochemical benefits as well by letting the oxygen be released into the tissues uh, more readily. So we can practice this as well. I'm going to guide a, a resonance frequency breath or a, a, a cadenced breath. So I'm going to guide five seconds in, five seconds out. If this feels too slow and it starts to feel upregulating because it's, it's a, a cadence that makes you feel breathless, please uh, make it quicker, maybe four or three seconds. On the other hand, it could also feel too quick and you can adjust upwards as well, six or seven seconds. I will, by the end, make it a little bit longer as we're into it, but just know that you don't have to listen to me. Like that's the way to do it. Adjust for, for your body. It's meant to just be equal parts in, equal parts out. Okay, so sit well again. Take a regular breath in and out for the nose. And on the inhale, we'll start for five, four, three, two, one, out, five, four, three, two, one, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, 
in two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, slight pause here, and then in again, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, slight pause, two, three, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, slight pause, two beats, and then keep it going at your own cadence here, in, maybe five seconds, maybe more or less, and out, and like a two to four beat pause at the bottom. In again. And as you continue breathing slowly here in this cadenced breath, see if you can't lighten up your breathing a little bit. Can you make it quieter and lighter, slightly minimized? And this is true functional breathing, a consistent rate of respiration, a true depth of breath, and a levity of breath that balances the blood gases. It may feel much different than how you normally breathe throughout the day. Ultimately, this is how we wanna be breathing. Nose, slow, and low. Give yourself about two more rounds here. And after those two rounds, you can return to normal breathing and notice the effects, how quickly you can downregulate just by slowing the breathing down to a simple cadence in and out. You don't have to do any of these fancy three, seven, eight breaths. It's just simple in and out, resonance frequency, slowing it down. So you, if you were doing the five and five, that's about six breaths a minute. That is nearly half or a third of what most people are breathing in a minute. So it's quite a reduction in the speed of breath uh, compared to subconscious breathing, but really the slower we can get the breath at rest, the better our bodies are functioning, the more oxygen that's being delivered, the more ATP that's being able to be created for our various bodily functions, the more oxygen you give to the brain, the most energy demandant organ in our body. So at, at rest without thinking about it, they say, you know, 12 to 14 breaths a minute was the, the average that you want to be at. Now, because people are so overstimulated and anxious, they've actually, the, the medical associations have risen that to 16 to 18 breaths a minute, which is insane. Um, yeah. So it's uh, it's five in five out might not seem that hard, but really it's a dramatic reduction in the, the speed of breath for most people at rest. Any questions or observations about the slow breathing? It's okay if not, yeah. 
I feel so relaxed, Tiger. It's really amazing. I mean, when you do this often during your day, I mean, then it really starts down your regulating you also during sports or when you have stressful situations or when you do your stamina trainings, then maybe it also helps to breathe as light as you can, I guess. Would you recommend that also trying that light breathing during um, stamina sport or long distance sports? Yeah, this morning I, I took a run here in the Berkshires and it's, it's, it's beautiful. And, and now anytime I go on a run, I'm, I'm not a runner for the record, but anytime I go on a run, I'm really just going to train my breath. So instead of what I used to do is just, you know, try to run X amount of miles and X amount of time, not concerned about my breathing. Now I see, you know, maybe I can run a quarter of a mile breathing light, or maybe I can run X amount of meters holding my breath, right? So there are tons of opportunities to play the functional breathing and, and a little bit of the, the breath, the other breath training we'll get into today. But yeah, it's, it's amazing what these simple techniques can do for us. Again, a lot of the breath work that's booming and becoming very popular is very stimulating. It's very big. It's very masculine. It's, it's powerful breathing. And really, I think most people need to learn how to downregulate and then they can play with the other stuff. But once you have this functional breathing and you're really operating at a place that is so in the middle and you can manipulate your breath to be upregulated or downregulated when you need to. It just gives you so, so many more choices in how you can feel and adapt to the things that you can't control. Um, yeah, so I'm glad that it felt nice for you too. Um, any other questions before we keep going? I promise we'll do something that won't put you to sleep soon. <laughs> Okay, great. So um, this isn't my favorite drug. No, I'm kidding. This is my favorite way to, way to breathe. Uh, I love this acronym because it's so easy to remember for most people. Uh, this is how, this is functional breathing. This is really how, I don't like to should on people a lot, but this is really how we should be breathing for our health, the health of our nervous system, our physiological systems and our mental health for sure. So you can remember this LSD, it stands for light, slow, deep, three pillars of functional breathing. So if you can just remember LSD when anytime throughout your day, you're, you're breath training, you're working on your breathing. It's the same thing as nose, because by breathing light, you gotta breathe through the nose, slow, slow, just as you said, and deep, which is low. So nose, slow, low, light, slow, deep. This is the way humans ought to be breathing at rest and in some forms of upregulated exercise as well, which you can train. So I keep talking about functional breathing and we've done a few exercises that may have presented challenge or ease in certain ways. So, but you may be wondering, well, how functional is my breathing? How, how do I know if my breathing is functional? I haven't been thinking about it 24 hours a day. So luckily we have a very convenient uh, way to measure this. And it is really a measure of how tolerant you are to the gas carbon dioxide. Again, it's our primary stimulus to breathe. So if you can become less sensitive, more tolerant to this gas, your breathing becomes more and more functional. So the metric we use is called the BOLT score, B-O-L-T. And the BOLT score uh, stands for body oxygen level test, body oxygen level test. And we will measure this together. If you have a, a watch or a phone timer, that will be really helpful because you will need to do your own measure. So grab one of those. I could also, um, count for you, but I think it's much easier to, to do it on your own. So find something that you can measure time with, even if it's just a clock in your room with a second hand. Okay. The phone is super easy because you have that uh, just little timer on it. 
So the Bolt score is essentially a, a, a kumbhaka, a breath hold. Um, and it's measured by taking, and I'll, I'll explain it before we, we practice it together. It's measured by taking a regular breath in and out through the nose. So that would be this in and out. And then after the breath out, you will close your nostrils. I like to do it this way by interlacing my hands and letting my thumbs stay lifted. And then I just gently stopper underneath my nose. I don't like just pinching the sides of the nostril because it's really sensitive tissue in there and I don't like jamming it close. So if you do want to use just one hand, just gently stopper the nostrils. So, you know, you can choose which hand variation you use. So it's a breath in, a breath out. You start your timer, you hold your breath after the exhale, and then you essentially hold your breath until you feel the first uh, definite desire to breathe. So the first stress to breathe in, that feeling, it's like, oh, I really need to take a breath in. You remove your hands and you try to take a nice light breath in. If you have to <gasps> gasp for air after doing it, you've held it too long and that's not your score. And, and the minute you, after the breath will let you take the breath in, you look at the time and that number of seconds is your score. So we can practice that now together. Yeah, yeah. When you first breathe in is when you stop the, the time. But really it should be just around, just slightly after you feel that hunger to, to breathe in because there's another test where you can test your maximum breathlessness. It's a different score than this. This is just that first definite desire to breathe. And it might take a couple of times to get used to what that sensation is for you. It's a subjective measure. Uh, so you might feel inclined to measure it a couple of times if you're not sure, but have your timer ready so that you can take a breath in through your nose, a breath out through your nose at your own time. And then you'll stop the nostrils, start the timer. And I recommend not looking at the timer <laughs> because you don't want it to be competitive. And then once you feel that first definite desire to breathe in, you move your hands, you breathe in, you stop the timer, that's your score. And usually um, people will measure it twice the first time they do it because they're unsure if they did it right. Um, so again, if you need to measure it to feel what that subjective feeling is for you, you can measure it but again. Does anybody have any questions about measuring the Bolt score if they're unsure? And we can wait till afterward and then after the breath hold, you always want to take a breath in because as you're holding your breath, uh, another gas called nitric oxide, not nitrous oxide, which is the laughing gas of the dentist, like not that one, <laughs> but nitric oxide is a very important gas in the body. And one of the things that it does is dilates blood vessels and dilates the airways. So when you, when you hold your breath after an exhale, that gas will pool in the nasal cavities as a result of your function of your body. And then you breathe in and you bring that down into the lungs and it will distribute the blood in the lungs better and, and bring a lot of that oxygen down to the alveoli. So you're losing, you're not losing a lot of that oxygen to just dead space up in the higher lobes of the lungs. Um, so does anybody have any questions about measuring the score. And we'll talk about what the scores mean in a second, but any questions about measuring? Yeah, do you wanna do, does everybody wanna do it again just to make sure? <laughs> wanna do it one more time? <laughs> yeah, let's measure one more time. Um, and if they're drastically different, <laughs> let me know and we can, we can troubleshoot. But once you've returned to a comfortable nasal breath, measure again, just to prove yourself. <laughs> So again, it's just like this graph says, breath in, breath out, after the breath out. So you're not holding your breath at the top, it's after the breath out that you hold your breath. Super important.
and then breath in after the breath hold, nice and slow and controlled. You don't want to feel like you're <laughs> immediately having to gasp. That would be too long of a breath hold for this score. Good. And did everybody measure twice? Yep. Okay, great. So um, I'm not going to ask you what your scores are, but I will tell you a little bit about uh, what your score means. So the most recent study we have done in 2017 says that there is an 89% chance your breathing is functional if you have a BOLT score of 25 or above. So if you're less than 25, not a bad thing, you're not doing anything wrong, it just suggests that there's a good chance that your breathing patterns throughout the day and especially maybe during sleep are maybe hyperventilatory or dysfunctional in a way that could be improved through, through breath training. So, oh, wow. I didn't set it like this. <laughs> um, that's weird. I think there we go. <laughs> I learned something new about my computer every day. Um, so 25 higher is really the functional breathing level. And, and, you know, this score isn't perfect, but this is in general, the metric. Eventually you want your bolt score to be over 40. This means that you can exercise and do anything you want while nasal breathing, pretty much. We want to get to a point where you can work out your hardest and still be breathing through the nose and not have to break in through mouth breathing. So 25 or higher for now, though, is the goal. And after the workshop, if you're interested in, in training your breath more, we can talk about that. So that's the bolt score. Any questions about measuring, about anything like that? Tiger, I have just a quick question about the point when you do the breath hold. Do you then also activate the bandhas in the in the belly, maybe the Udiana bandha? Do you pull in the belly or do you just leave the belly, yeah, just as normal or as, as yeah it, as it is? So for, or... for the purpose of this, I want your body to relax. Um, more ancient techniques will play with that um, either on the inhalation hold or the exhalation hold. And we're not going to get so much into the bandhas today because I think that is a much more nuanced conversation. So for, for any breath holding we do in this workshop and anything oxygen advantage related, we want the body to feel relaxed so that as the carbon dioxide is mounting in the blood, through, through measuring things like the bolt score when we're holding our breath and more of that CO2 is being retained in the blood as a byproduct of cellular respiration and it becomes more and more uncomfortable to keep holding the breath. We wanna train the body to relax into that as much as possible so that we can train the adaptation to be calmer as the stimulus grows. Does that make sense? We just wanna relax into it, yeah. Okay. Nelson, did you have a question? Are you good? Uh, no, I I just thought, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I, I just thought I was, um, I ended it because I was, I felt like I was maybe cheating a little bit. Maybe, maybe there was some breath coming in, you know, on, on some unintentional response, <laughs> but I, I was satisfied with my score. Okay, great. Um, so as I said, it's a subjective measure. So not everybody will feel this. Sometimes you might know that it's time to breathe in when you feel a spasm of the diaphragm or when you feel like you might need to swallow. Like if you're holding your breath and your body starts to want swallowing, that's your body saying, I'm trying to breathe in, but I'm overriding the signal. Uh, yeah, so you can uh, pay attention for those. Um, not everybody will necessarily feel that, but a, a lot of people do. Okay. Alrighty. So naturally the question that comes after how functional is my breathing is, how do I improve my functional breathing? And we, we talked a little bit about it already. Um, ideally when you can remember breathing that is light, slow and deep, nose slow and low. 
is the name of the game. So that would be the way to breathe when you're conscious during the day, <laughs> but also eventually at night when you aren't aware of how you're breathing. This is not a sleep workshop, but I will say that breathing, sleep and mental health work together in tandem. If you're not sleeping well, your breathing is probably poor because you're stressed <laughs> and then your mental health is probably poor. And if your mental health is poor, your breathing is probably poor and your sleep is probably poor. So, um, but if your breathing is good, your sleep is probably good and your mental health is probably good. So um, those three things really hinge on each other. So if you are somebody who, because as we talked about the signs of dysfunctional breathing earlier, one of the big ones I didn't put up there because we're not talking about sleep so much is snoring. That's dysfunctional breathing for sure. Um, so during the night, if you know that you snore or if you perhaps know that you have something like sleep apnea or if you wake up with a dry mouth, these are signs you've probably been mouth breathing throughout the night, which as I've said several times, the mouth is not for breathing, even though it tries. It's the nose that we want to be breathing through. I tape my mouth every night when I go to bed um, with myotape. It's this blue tape that goes around my lips. Um, you can also get surgical tape and put it over your lips. It's a fantastic thing to do, especially um, because unless you have a partner who tells you that you snore or mouth breathe or do something else annoying breathing at night, we don't know how we breathe at night because we're not conscious. So taping the mouth is a fantastic thing to do for sleep. And maybe eventually on the platform, we'll do a sleep and breathing workshop. Uh, but if I had to give one piece of advice for improving breathing during sleep, it's taping the mouth. Um, and I can send you guys some links for that afterward. The other component of breath training is called intermittent hypercapnic hypoxic training. So that's a big mouthful of words. I didn't coin the term, believe me. Um, essentially, we can break it down though. So hypercapnic, this is higher levels, elevated levels of carbon dioxide and hypoxic, lower levels of oxygen. And working in, just like, um, like if you've ever heard of like HIT, like high intensity interval training, we can basically do this for our breath by doing short bursts of bumping up CO2 and, and um, breathing less oxygen to start to improve our tolerance to CO2. Um, this is also called the simulation of high altitude training, or if you happen to live in the Alps or in the Rocky Mountains, you could just probably go outside. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for most people who live close to sea level, or if you do live at an elevation and you just really want to train the breath, this is the name of the game and it's what we're going to talk about next. So intermittent, hypercapnic, hypoxic training. If I'm ever writing it down or talking shorthand, it's just IHHT or simulation of high altitude training. This kind of breathing is uh, really, really bumping up the levels of CO2. So, um, and it's done with a lot of breath holding. So it's not for people who are pregnant, have high blood pressure or any other maybe more severe respiratory or cardiac conditions, this, um, it's very upregulating. It's, it's true breath training. It is, these are stressors for the body. We are intentionally stressing the body mind, stressing the breathing to create adaptations to, to raise our tolerance to CO2, to become less sensitive to this very important gas for breathing. So the simulation of high altitude training or IHHT is not anything new. Oxygen advantage didn't invent it. I certainly didn't invent it. It's been around forever. Um, and it's called Humbaka in the realm of yoga and Ayurveda. And really there are, there are two forms of Humbaka. It's holding the breath after the inhale or holding the breath after the exhale. Most of what I'm going to show you and actually all for today will be breath holds after the exhalation because they give, um, they set you up more successfully uh, to raise the level of CO2 in the body more efficiently. So breath holding is the extreme 
essentially of breathing light. So as we worked on the breathe light and we were getting our breath so, so tiny in and out, and we felt that tease, those little spoonfuls of air hunger, uh, this takes it further. So by ceasing the breath completely, we are confronted much more quickly with the amount of carbon dioxide as a result of our cellular respiration waste products, waste products, so that, that CO2 is going to rise much, much more in, in the body, in the blood, and it's going to feel stressful. It's going to feel like, oh my gosh, I need to take a breath in. So it, this is also not a kind of breath training for people who are really prone to anxiety or panic attacks, because those people are already feeling high intense amounts of um, heightened carbon dioxide and that's what's triggering the hyperventilation. So for people who have lots of um, anxiety or prone to panic attacks or um, just maybe can't handle the, the great upregulation, stick to the light breathing, stick to the deep and slow breathing. That will is a more gentle form. This is more intense. And it's one of those examples of ancient wisdom being proofed by modern science. So Ayurveda and yoga have known since its inception that if you're not incorporating kumbhaka, if you're not incorporating those holes on the top and bottom of the breath, it's not really pranayama. This is eventually the, the kind of pranayama that's most advanced after you've been training and practicing the breath it's breath that's imperceptible. It's like you're not even breathing at all. And, and yogis in, in ancient days would be able to suspend their breath for minutes at a time. And now the only people who do that today in society are really free divers. <laughs> if you're diving and, and, and um, swimming in, in deep water. Uh, so it's an ancient art that modern science is reviving, thankfully, because is this is really how you will up your bold score. This is really how you will train the, the tolerance to carbon dioxide. And as a result, by working on these stressors, your functional breathing will improve because as a result of being less stimulated by carbon dioxide, naturally the body will be able to breathe lighter, slower, and deeper because it's not as easily upregulated or aroused by the presence of carbon dioxide. And I love this quote because I think it encapsulates just what I'm talking about of it being such an ancient practice. The real meaning of pranayama, according to Patanjali, the founder of yogic philosophy, is the gradual cessation of breathing. So all these big upregulating breaths eventually graduate into suspending the breath and having this breath that's imperceptible so that it's a discontinuance of the inhalation and exhalation. It's such a retreat inward into oneself that it leads into that true deep meditation. And it's a wonderful thing to feel uh, when you practice it. And the, the benefits of this kind of breath training are not only for your own mind and then the mental uh, calmness that can result, but you know, we live life in a body, the mind is in the body. So inevitably when we're out in the world and we're being stimulated by things out of our control, stress is out of our, con our control, training this kind of breath makes us more resilient to not only internal mental stimuli and reasons why we need to calm the mind, but external stimuli as well that we can't control. Uh, because when we can find that gap in our breath, holding the breath, that pause between action and reaction and turn it into response. We're really riding the waves instead of being drowned by them. Um, and we'll practice a little bit of this so you can understand the, the real uh, effort it takes to make something like this feel so graceful. Any questions about anything I just said before we practice something more upregulating? Okay, so I'm going to ask you to stand up. <laughs> We've been sitting a long time. I think it will feel nice to <laughs> stand up. I'm gonna adjust the camera, just bring me a little bit further. 
There we go. Okay. We're gonna start a little bit lighter and then we'll get into we'll get into the meat of it. But you know, first just shake out the body a little bit, do any little uh, movements you need to do after sitting for a while. So maybe some nice hip circles, whatever you need to do, get that blood flow back. <laughs> um, if you have a, a room that you're in and you can walk around it, that will be good. Otherwise you can walk and, and step in place. That's fine too. It might be more interesting for the brain to be able to walk around your space a little bit. So just start to pace around your space. You can walk in a circle, in a straight line, whatever you like, don't think too hard about it. And begin to breathe normally through the nose. Ideally, the, the breath is a bit light. It's a bit slow, still have that depth of breath. And then I want you to take a regular breath in through the nose and a regular breath out through the nose and then stop where the nostrils, pinch the nose and hold. And I want you to take 10 steps. 10 paces, holding the breath after the exhale. And then after the 10, release, gently inhale and exhale. And that 10 steps felt like way too much. You can bump it down to eight or five, but let's go with 10 for now. And once the breath returns to that regular nasal breath, it's comfortable. It's hopefully somewhere in the light, slow, deep realm. Take a breath in through the nose, a breath out through the nose, pinch the nose and hold gently and take 10 steps again. After your 10, you release your hand, you inhale gently, light as you can. And you start to breathe nice and light. So after a breath hold, you never wanna be gasping for air. It's too much. So keep walking around your space. Just gonna pace up and down my mat. And once you're feeling recovered from that, take a breath into the nose, a breath out through the nose, pinch the nose and hold and take 15 steps. Again, if you down modified, take maybe a little bit more than you took. So 15 steps. And once you reach your 15, release, inhale as gently as you can. This is really the key here. Gentle, gentle, gentle inhale. If you don't have any space to walk around, you can just step in place. <laughs> Good. And breathe light. Let the, let the breath become very spacious and quiet. And when you're ready, breath in through the nose. Breath out through the nose. Pinch the nose and hold. Take 15 steps again. You can walk a little bit faster, like a normal cadence, like you're walking down the street. And after your 15 paces, gently, as gently as you can, inhale. And keep the breath now light as you're walking so that you might even feel the sensation that you're sustaining that air hunger just a little bit. Keep the breath nice and light. And we'll get more challenging to do as we start to bump this up. Okay. So now that we've warmed up the breath holds a little bit, we can start to take this a little bit more rigorously. Breath in through the nose. Breath out through the nose. Pinch the nose and hold. Take 20 to 25 steps. Feel a bit of a stronger breath hold. And then gentle breath in, so tiny, minimize the breath. Really minimize it. So that first breath in is small, so that you're sustaining just for a little bit that feeling of air hunger. You're purposefully introducing stress to the body-mind. Good. And let your pace be a little bit quicker, you know, like you're really walking down the street or something. <laughs> We're walking down a nice trail. Good. 
And then once you feel fully recovered, a gentle nasal breath, not feeling so upregulated, we're gonna bump this up a bit. So breath into the nose, breath out to the nose, pinch the nose and hold, and just begin to walk, just walk. As the air hunger starts to build, start to bring it into a little bit of a jog, just a little jog. Keep holding the breath. And as the air hunger starts to mount, take it a little bit faster. Maybe you don't have the space and you can just run in place. Run in place, run in place until it's so strong that you have to pause and take a gentle breath in. Minimize the breathing. The first few breaths in are so tiny. So you're sustaining that hypercapnia, that higher level of CO2, so tiny. And then keep walking around. Keep the breath small, keep it small. Should feel challenging. So what we're doing, is we take an inhale and an exhale, we hold the breath, we walk. And as the air hunger starts to build, we jog. And as the air hunger starts to build, we sprint, which you might have to do in place if you don't have the, the space. And then the air hunger should build to a strong sensation, much stronger than that bolt score, but not to the point where you have to take a big mouth breath in afterwards you want to be able to release the breath hold and your first breath in keeping it tiny and minimized as tiny as you can it's really hard to do but that is where the adaptation occurs when you start to breathe again and you can train your body to handle those higher levels of co2 by breathing smaller that's where the bolt score will learn to increase okay after that one we'll give you know 30 seconds to a minute to recover we don't want to be doing this one after another so quickly because we want the body to be more fully at rest when we begin again. So once you're feeling recovered, you can start again. It's a breath in through the nose, a breath out to the nose. Stop the breathing, pinch the nose and hold. You get to walk, good pace. And then once the air hunger starts to mount, you start to take it into a jog. You're jogging, you're jogging, you're jogging, you're holding your breath. And once it starts to get stronger, you start to sprint even faster, maybe in place, keep it going, keep it going until it's so strong that you have to pause and gently breathe in. Gentle, gentle, tiny, 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 tiny. So small, you can start to walk around, keep the breath small, control it. it should feel really challenging. And if it doesn't feel challenging to minimize that breath after holding, you need to hold it for longer. You need to keep going. Your tolerance is higher, which is good. Eventually you wanna be able to sprint up a hill holding your breath like I did this morning. It's really hard, <laughs> but um, it's, it's does fantastic things for the, for the stress response. It really makes you more resilient. If you can handle doing this, man, there's a lot your nervous system can handle. So, Another 20 seconds or so to recover. Again, we, we're gonna do it one more time and you always wanna do it from a recovered state. You don't wanna feel like you're gasping for breath and starting again, it's gonna push you over the edge. It's gonna to feel too much. You should not feel like you have an excess of saliva in your mouth right now. You might even feel like your mouth is a little dry because <laughs> you're starting to upregulate. Once you feel completely recovered, Normal nasal breath, you can begin again. So it's a breath into the nose, breath out to the nose, pinch the nose and hold, begin to walk a nice rapid pace, and then bring it into a jog. Start with a light jog. Then as the air hunger starts to build, you move it faster. Maybe you start to sprint in place if your space doesn't accommodate you, and you go fast, 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 until it's such a strong hold that you've reached your limit. Tiny breath in, minimize the breathing, tiny breath out. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Good, you can walk around a little bit if that helps, but keep the breath really small. Inch in, inch out. Inch in, inch out. So we're incorporating this light breathing after the intermittent hypercapnic hypoxic training simulation of high altitude to sustain the hypercapnia to train those adaptations in the body. Good. So what's been happening is we've been dramatically increasing the level of CO2 in the body, which feels uncomfortable. And like you really, your breath is and you need to breathe in. 
And then we sustain that after we do the hold and we breathe light. So the, so the CO2 stays elevated. This has dispersed so much oxygen into your tissues and organs. This, this is a great thing to do before any kind of resistance training, any kind of physical exercise, because now your body is so oxygenated and it's gonna be less sore after any kind of training you do. Good. And once you've come back to, to baseline, you can find a, find a seat again. And I will take any questions you have or observations. How did that feel? Was it challenging? Let me know. What, what went on? It felt good, Tiger. And I kind of caught myself when I was jogging faster that one time when I did it, I kind of got like a panic or my heart rate um, increased significantly at that moment. But uh, yeah, maybe this happens when it's just when you're training and yeah, enhancing your yeah. tolerance, maybe it's just that it's moment. a stressor. It's a yeah. stressor for sure. The heart rate will increase and and it's important to recognize, you know, what is a sensation of upregulation and, and healthy stress versus this is sending me into a mental place I do not want to be in, right? So for some people, this is too much. And so that's why I always caution before, like if you're somebody with, you know, a lot of anxiety you're working with and it's very physiological anxiety, you want to take this easy. And, and maybe instead of sprinting, you just, the jog is the most you do or a fast walk. But um, this kind of training several times a week, not every day, but several times a week is going to really help that bolt score. It's really training your tolerance to CO2. Tomorrow, if any of you feel a little bit of a headache, very normal because your body isn't used, your brain isn't used to this much, much oxygen being sent to it. So you can get a little bit of a high altitude headache sometimes um, from the light breathing or from the, the CO2 tolerance training. Yeah. Any other observations or questions or follow-up questions? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not muted. A uh, couple things uh, that you're, a um, couple of the terminology things that you use there. Uh, I ran for a lot of years and I was a terrible breather. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised I did as well as I did. But anyway, uh, I didn't learn breathing until I got into yoga, which was a long ways after I got into uh, uh, running. But uh, one of the things I learned, I, I used to call, we used to call LSD long, slow distance. And mm. for people who wanted to train in short terms and sprinting and stuff like that, you always took a day off and ran long and just didn't open your mouth. No, you just run at a pace where you can just feel very gliding. And it taught mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the it expanded the capillaries in the blood. The longer you can go at a slow distance, so you you took advantage of the short hard work you did, and you made it into long. So long, it was called long slow distance, and it was always a component of each week's uh, uh, workout. The, I the love other, that connection. Yeah, and the other thing I uh, I always used in my uh, personal training uh, world was I always uh, used the expression, uh, what what you just mentioned, but in a different way, S-A-I-D, the word said, specific adaptation to impose demand. So wherever you want to impose a demand, whether it's your physical body, muscles, or the breathing, in order to be an Olympian, a champion Olympian, right, you have to, you have to challenge uh, the body. So uh, specific adaptation to impose demand is the way humans get better. Yes. And yeah. And I, and I think that there's a, a range of, of better, right? Because yeah. if I'm working with, you know, if I were to have a client who's a professional athlete and their big paychecks or their hometown rep is dependent on winning matches, well, my goal for them isn't to breathe 100% through the nose. Like my goal for you is to win the match. Right. Yeah, right. Um, so 
for people like that, it's okay, well, how can we get the breathing 50% during the match? Or how can we train the breathing during training so that during the match, you get that glidey feeling, that more effortless feeling. For people who are who are recreational athletes or you know, yogis just interested in improving the breath, I think the first and most important thing is the functional breathing. And once you have breathing at rest that is effortless, you can do those specific training adaptations. Like you can really work the breath. You can really, you know, train X, Y, and Z. I think the functional breathing is the most important. And yeah, and it's it's great that for the, all those years you were practicing the nasal breathing while running, I encourage anybody who is a runner to let go of their notion that I need to run for this distance or I need to run for this time and try how long can I run comfortably through my nose, breathing through my nose. Um, and it, it's really hard. You're not going to get any less of a workout, um, but it will be frustrating. You'll be, you'll be able to run far shorter distances at first. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I just said, look at anybody at the gym on a treadmill or a stick master. They look like Neanderthal breathing through their mouth. Like, it's just, um, again, it, it comes down to function. The mouth has zero function for good, for breathing, for cellular respiration, for producing ATP, the energy you need to keep going. Uh, something um, that I emphasize too is if you are somebody who, you know, likes to do HIIT workouts or high intense cardio things, um, running or weightlifting, you know, any kind of very upregulating exercise if that's what you're into, taking just five minutes to breathe slowly and deeply on your back after that training to re-oxygenate the body and refill those stores, I guarantee you, you'll be able to the next day be more functional and be more resilient because this is, this isn't breath training Olympics, right? You don't get points for doing these fancy breath training techniques. The reason why we train the breath is to do the things we love better and longer and throughout our whole lives. So if you want to get up the next day and take a run. Okay, great. It does no good to tax yourself the day before by long distance mouth breathing, breathe through your nose, breathe less. And the next day you'll be able to do it again because you, your calf muscles will be less sore because they've had more oxygen and less lactate. Um, so it's, yeah, it's amazing. And Paige had a question too. Mm -hmm. Right. Paige's question is after we're doing the more intense breath holds and we try to have a light breath in after, because I said, um, you don't want to have to gasp for air after doing the breath holds. She asks, how do I know if I'm, if I held it too long or not enough, like how light is a light breath in after? And yes, your intuition is correct. It is a subjective measure. And I can see when it's too much, like if you have to really <gasps> gas her and it feels like it's so uncontrolled, that's too much. As you first start training the breath in this more um, uh, hypercapnic way, that uh, ability to breathe light after the longer breath hold at first will feel a little um, pressurized. It will feel a little bit like forced, like, oh, like I'm really trying to control it. That's super normal. Um, eventually, as you train it, you'll get to a point where maybe that first one is like, but then you can easily regulate it. So it's tricky also because the, the more you train your breath, the longer you'll be able to hold your breath. And so it's, it's like a staircase. Like you want to work on it and maintain it, work on it and maintain it. So that, that light breathing after the breath hold shouldn't feel so easy. Like you're at rest doing the really calming light breathing, because then you haven't stressed the body enough to get the adaptation, but it should not feel like a big gaspy mouth breath. You should be able to take it through the nose. Yeah. And when I'm really working on improving, like, and I, and I up my time or distance that I'm holding my breath, that first breath in will be a little, uh, sharp. 
because I'm not used to it yet. So that's, that's totally normal as well. Um, did anybody have any other questions that popped up about the breathing? Okay, so there's one last uh, technique I want to play with because I, I get a lot of questions about things like the Wim Hof method or Bastrika, like really big breaths in and out. Like, oh, if this isn't oxygenating me, like you say it is, like, why do we do this, right? So I'm not here to talk about the Wim Hof method. I'm not a certified instructor and I, I don't practice it regularly myself. Um, however, I do guide Bastrika and I do guide Kapalabhati in these bigger breaths, these breaths that very much uh, rid the body of a lot of CO2 and keep the oxygen very bound in the blood. So I want to practice one of those to emphasize the breath holding that I think is necessary, bracketing those techniques. So after you exchange a lot of air in and out and it's a big hyperventilatory style breath, your ability to hold your breath is going to be a lot um, greater. You'll be able to hold your breath for longer because without all of that CO2 in the blood, you've expelled it all it takes a longer time for that to rebuild to your tolerance level. So you can have these wonderful suspensions and retentions of breath and get those maybe more psychological stilling and centering components of Kumbhaka and, and breath holding. Um, so moral of the story being, if, if you practice this big breathing, there needs to be um, some breath holding to regain and rebalance the blood gases and also for the stilling effects of the mind. So we'll practice one of those before we close out because I think that it, it's a fun way to practice um, the bigger breathing that's also safer uh, through the nose. If you are, again, this is not a breath for somebody who's pregnant. It's not a breath for somebody who has any kind of lung or heart or respiratory conditions that are more severe, high blood pressure, it's not the, the best breath for that. And if you are working or in living with one of those um, conditions, either observe or just practice light breathing as we do this, because it's really not so, so safe all the time if you have a more serious condition. So that's my contraindication and caveat. <laughs> so sit well. We're going to do essentially <laughs> 20 breaths in and out to the nose, but instead of a light, slow, deep breath, it's gonna be a big, big breath, big in, big out, so that we can feel the effects of the breath hold afterward being so much longer than what you were doing when you were holding the breath and, and working the body, All right? So just a few breaths in and out through the nose, relax the, the face and body, but keep the front body open and available. Plug your feet in, reach tall to the crown of the head. I will guide the inhalations and exhalations. So let's start with a regular breath in and out. And we'll begin. Big breath in through the nose, big breath out. Big breath in, big breath out. Big breath in, big breath out. Big breath in. Big breath out, big breath in, big breath out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, halfway there, in. Out, in, 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 out, in. 
out, hold your breath. You can stop at the nostrils, hold your breath. Relax the face and body. Let the body be still, let the mind start to smooth out like ripples in a pond becoming still. You'll be able to hold your breath longer than your bolt score usually here because all of the CO2 has been expelled. Let your body relax as feelings of air hunger might start to build. And as the air hunger starts to build, once you get to that point where you know you have to take a breath in, you release and you breathe in as calmly as you can. But go until you really feel that desire. You might be surprised how long you can hold your breath here. And only when you're ready to breathe back in, do you breathe back in and invite a very light, slow and deep breath in when you do. As you begin to breathe again, notice the quality of the mind, of the body. How still and smooth the breath can feel. How nearly imperceptible, right? Just as Patanjali said, eventually it's about the discontinuance of inhalation and exhalation and take a smooth and tiny breath in and out. That feels like you're not even trying. The air floods in and the air floods out. This is all a result of you manipulating the body's biochemistry. Playing with expelling so much CO2 that you have a longer chance for it to build up and the longer, it takes much longer to feel that breathlessness. So anytime that you do any big breathing like this in yoga class, incorporate that kumbhaka at the end and it really will help to balance the blood gases more. And, and hopefully now that you understand more, as I said, what's going on under the hood during your breathing, during your pranayama, it uh, has maybe inspired you to play with a few different things in your own breathing practice or own exercise practices and give you just a little bit more insight into your own nervous system and how breathing truly is the front door and driver's steering wheel of it. Thank you so much for joining me for these past two hours. If you have any more questions, let me know. I'm, I'm here to answer any and all questions. We didn't, you know, there's a lot more that we can explore and, and I'm sure we will with further workshops, but hopefully this gave you a nice overview into functional breathing and the simulation of high altitude training. The, um, uh, the onset of uh, the, the desire for air is pre uh, preceded by uh, saliva. The saliva buildup is an indication, right? That mm -hmm. is there. It, the more I did it, the more I realized, oh, there's the indicator right there. Even though I could go a little bit longer, the saliva yeah. was really, the buildup was really uh, pretty significant. I never noticed. And that's that's great. It means that that breath hold for you was doing what it's supposed to do, which is balance the blood gases and down regulate you a bit. So instead of that stressful fight or flight breathing, the holding the breath at the end after the exhale yeah. will bring you back down to earth so that you were feeling that buildup of saliva. That means that the nervous system where it was very sympathetic and less parasympathetic was becoming balanced again. Yeah. So that's great. What, what's the name of the product they use for tape on your... Or, it's or called Myotape, M-Y-O-T-A-P-E. Okay. I'll send, I'll send a, a link to all the I'll people just, who get the workshop, or I'll put it in the, the description of the recording too. Okay. 
I'll go to the drugstore and see if I, I I've practiced. It won't be at the drugstore. Um, oh. It's an Oxygen Advantage product and it will ship oh. to you very quickly, but from Ireland. Okay. And it is the first kind of mouth tape really invented. Um, yeah. So, but it's my favorite one. The others I find either don't stay on and I prefer one that goes around my lips instead of directly on it. Um, See, but you can get surgical tape too and just put it on your lips. Yeah. So you can't really uh, keep your mouth closed during, even though I think I have since I read the book, I read Nestor's book. I think mm -hmm. I'm keeping my mouth closed, but maybe I'm not. Most people aren't at, throughout the whole night unless they're taping. Okay. Yeah, if your mouth is dry, in the morning at all you've been mouth breathing and also it's a large conversation but position of the body when you're sleeping yeah. like yeah. your yeah. your head is up and back your mouth is probably open versus yeah. tucking the chin and sleeping on your side um so okay yeah right. but I'll, I'll send you all the the links to anything thank i mentioned today thank you so much my pleasure yeah. thank you for coming well so nice yeah. to have you. yes very very balanced uh, class and uh, worth all the time Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Tiger. It was really Thank great. You. They have some nice insights I can play with and it was great information. Thank I'm you. I'm so glad. Yeah, it's it's uh, not very intuitive, a lot of this, but once you can feel it in the body after practicing it, it's like, wow, I, I'll never breathe the same again. <laughs> Bless you. Yeah. I'm so glad okay. you enjoyed it. Have a great day, guys. See you.